So um, I want to tell you my story from a personal perspective because, of course, uh, throughout my career, recent career in this field, often people get misapprehensions or misimpressions about where I'm coming from. So uh, I'd like to begin uh, actually in 1996. At that time, uh, of course, Proposition 215 had just been passed. And unfortunately, that year I was diagnosed with hepatitis C. And uh, don't know where I got it from, never been an IV drug user, but uh, anyways, there I was. And uh, so in 1997, I entered a clinical trial at the Veterans Hospital here in San Francisco for pegylated interferon, which was the new standard of care at that time. And of course, uh, interferon has a, a large impact on one's immune system. There's many uh, side effects from that uh, medication, including lack of appetite, uh, insomnia, skin rashes, uh, psychological issues in terms of clinical depression. Never been a, depressed a day in my life until I started shooting interferon, <laughs> right? But that certainly uh, brought me to that point. So um, I uh, sought out uh, uh, medical marijuana, you know, to mitigate those symptoms. Of course, Proposition 215 had just been passed, and uh, it was available and legal on the state level at that time, and uh, uh, I certainly sought it out. Of course, I, I've been using marijuana since 1967, um, so I, you know, I was experienced with it, knew what it was all about. Um, so it wasn't a problem for me to get it or to uh, make it available to myself to mitigate those symptoms. The problem was um, that interferon uh, caused me to be immunocompromised <clears throat> and uh, you know my immune system was just like going right down the tubes. I wasn't that happy in terms of the uh, level of microbiological contaminants and possible adulterants that might be found in the medicine that I was able to access at that time. And I was concerned, you know, in terms of my own safety, and uh, I knew everything that I could get would certainly be efficacious, but uh, in terms of its quality profile and its sanitation, uh, given that I was immunocompromised, I had a lot of concern, right? So unfortunately, that year of treatment and those drug trials failed and didn't work. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, I kind of put all that aside, right? Well, uh, uh, speed up to 2004, a second drug had been approved called ribavirin uh, for a dual uh, drug combination therapy. That, that really increased the side effects of the treatment. Uh, these are 48-week uh, treatment uh, protocols, so it's not like interferon is a chemotherapy-type drug, so it's not like kind of chemotherapy that you do for three months, but you're, it's a whole year, all right? So first year was already done. Second year, um, tried it with the two drugs, and of course I was using medical cannabis again uh, to mitigate those symptoms. After 50 weeks of treatment, my immune system collapsed. Um, I developed epididymitis, if you all know what that is. I won't describe it to you. <laughs> the physicians know. Uh, rushed to the emergency room, you know, put on morphine, all that kind of stuff. And again, I, I still was not able to access a, a quality of a medical cannabis different than what I was accessing in 97. So, you know, my background throughout the 80s, I was involved in international aid and development programs. I went to school here in Berkeley and studied political science, as a matter of fact, and uh, then international management after that, and worked for various nonprofit international aid organizations uh, throughout the 80s. And so I was an internationalist in perspective, if you will, and was a generalist in the sense that I was sent into different countries with political conflict and have to build industries, either cottage industries or medium-scale industries and supply chain solutions. So uh, in 1990, I got involved in the cashmere industry and uh, developed some companies there and had a lot of experience in natural product manufacturing. And whether it's cashmere or cannabis or Chanel or chocolate, uh, all of those natural products share something in common in terms of the manufacturing process. Uh, in any case, I was following very closely uh, the work at CMCR and uh, the work of MAPS because I felt those two organizations were doing a really good science work as best as they could under the circumstances. So uh, after reviewing all of their information a few years later uh, in 2007, I decided to go to WHO in Geneva uh, to visit a gentleman by the name of Dr. Willem Schulten. And I, I, I imagine our Dutch uh, friends here in the audience know who he is. He was the first director of the Office of uh, Medicinal Cannabis of the Dutch Health Ministry. 
and uh, Willem had been uh, seconded to WHO to work on their Office of Controlled Medicines, which uh, uh, their brief is to get morphine to people who, don't a who can't access morphine because of regressive uh, drug laws. You know, it came about as uh, the enabling legislation of the international treaties. So Willem uh, directed me to The Hague, to his colleagues there, at the, his replacement, uh, Dr. Marco Vandeveld, who ran the Mar uh, Office of Medicinal Cannabis. And he passed me along to uh, Bedra Kian and uh, a very well-known chemist by the name of Dr. Arno Hoskamp, who's done a lot of very good work. And uh, so uh, during that time, of course, we were just in a discussion period between 2007 and 2009. We got to know each other really well. I was very excited about their work because, you know, Bedrican was a little bit different than the other two nationally licensed sources of research-grade material. Those other two sources being the University of Mississippi and NIDA, and of course Prairie Plant Systems under Health Canada in, in Canada. So uh, the difference between those is that NIDA uh, and Health Canada own the proprietary rights of those cultivars. They essentially own uh, what's you know, being done in Mississippi, and Health Canada owns what Prairie Plant Systems does. So there's no commercial path, if you will. Uh, in spite of Rick's great work and great efforts you know, to, to bring uh, cannabis through the FDA drug approval process, and I might say if Rick was in this room, uh, he, he would tell you, as he's told me many times, he believes in the drug approval process and the clinical trial process as being a valid methodology uh, to determine uh, you know, the kinds of medicines that people have access to. Not that there shouldn't be other points of access and community access and, and all that. But uh, in terms of the, the clinical trials and the science and the methodology, um, he agrees with that, and so do I. And that's why I studied uh, what Rick was doing very, very closely, read every transcript and everything that he wrote and everything that was written about MAPS. One thing I discovered was in terms of the NIDA monopoly, and I think Alan will bear this out because we've gone through the, the legal analysis there. One thing I discovered and brought up to Rick and, and Alan was that the monopoly uh, and the PHS review committee only come to bear when one relies upon NIDA material from the National Drug Supply Program. And during the federal uh, hearings uh, <coughs> over Nick's, uh, Rick's uh, various applications, Stephen Gus, Dr. Dus Gus from NIDA, who was in charge of the National Drug Supply Program, basically came out and said that as long as you don't ask for our material, you don't have to go through the PHS review committee. Well, that was a startling little tidbit of information in my mind because if that's the case, well, then why can't we just import research-grade material from the Netherlands, right? Because they were manufacturing it there, and also it wasn't under a lockbox by the Canadian government or the U.S. government. Roll forward a little bit to 2009 and the election of uh, President Obama and the Ogden Memo. Uh, that kind of gave the, the folks at Bedrican the uh, space, you might say, the political space to call me up and say, let's form a joint venture and see if we can uh, project our knowledge into other jurisdictions, right? And that's what we did. We formed a company called Bedrican International, right? And uh, essentially the, the mission of that company was to seek license to manufacture medicinal cannabis in any jurisdiction globally outside of the EU, where Bedricam BB was already well, well positioned there. So for a number of years, I traveled around the world in terms of looking at different locations and jurisdictions like Canada, Israel, Brazil, various other countries that might either have medicinal cannabis programs or might be putting them in place in the near future so that we could seek out the ability to manufacture in those countries. At the same time, uh, we were very interested in clinical trial work. So uh, during the pursuit of that, especially in Canada, we prepared a clinical trial application for Health Canada and went ahead and uh, submitted what's called a pre-CTA document, same as a pre-IND document. In that document, you, uh, and this was done with uh, Professor uh, Dr. Mark Weir from uh, McGill University. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He is the preeminent uh, cannabis researcher in Canada, just as maybe Donald is our preeminent uh, researcher here in the, in, the, in the U.S. So Mark uh, also received funds from the Canadian government, about $1.7 million of the $7 million that uh, the Canadian government allotted for research. They couldn't actually put out all that money. All the 1.7 million was more or less used up by Mark, and there weren't any other applications to get that money. 
And uh, so, in any case, we filed uh, in 2010 a pre-CTA document. In fact, Health Canada said it was, I think, one of the best uh, uh, CTA documents they'd ever seen, cannabis or no cannabis. And this is cannabis as a botanical drug, not pharmaceuticalized, uh, not extracts, but cannabis flowers, cannabis floss, right? That is the essential medicine, and uh, <clears throat> that's why we sought to do that. And essentially the outcome uh, of that submission was that Health Canada gave us the green light. Uh, in the big conference room in Ottawa there, when we did our presentation, when Mark went through the science and, and uh, I went through some of the commercial and political aspects of what might be required, uh, officials in Health Canada were relieved. You could just see a big sigh of relief that somebody was finally stepping forward to address the science questions here and not leave physicians and other healthcare professionals trying to prescribe uh, an unapproved drug product they didn't have enough data on, right? So I found great uh, encouragement by the attitude of those officials in Canada. Unfortunately, at the same time, or just before that time, there was a change of government in the Netherlands. And <laughs> you know this, right? So the Christian, yeah, right. The Christian Democrats were elected, and many of you might have heard about the anti-cannabis campaign that they were on. You know, close the coffee shops, right? They want to declare cannabis as 15% THC or above to be a hard drug in the same category as heroin uh, or cocaine, and they eventually turned their attention to uh, the medicinal cannabis program. So, uh, of course, uh, we were having discussions all, all, all over the world, and, and I was giving presentations in state legislatures and meeting with folks in the industry here on the state level, not to do business per se, you know, because, of course, as a nationally licensed entity, Bedrican could not get involved uh, in any uh, activity that was in, uh, not in compliance with federal law, because there would be blowback and problems for them, problems for the Dutch government. But eventually, you know, I did very, you guys probably never heard of me because I'm a very low profile kind of person, but I did do a few press interviews that got the attention of the health ministry. And uh, basically they told Bedrican that, uh, well, either you guys back out of the U.S. and forget about this or we're going to cancel your contract. And so when you only have one customer, that's, that's an existential threat. And <laughs> so when my Dutch colleagues met me in Ottawa, uh, they had to drop the, the hammer on me, and in spite of our great uh, investment, both financially and time-wise, uh, essentially they said, hey, to me, haircut time, Michael. <laughs> um, so, sorry, nothing we can do about it. And, uh, and that, that was okay. I mean, that's how things work out. After all, the motto the Bedrican had was, this is cannabis, right? So you can't expect anything to kind of flow in the normal, regular way that uh, things normally do. So... Uh, that disappeared for me, and uh, I decided to go back uh, uh, to, into treatment again on May 24th of 2011. FDA approved a third drug for hepatitis C, a protease in inhibitor uh, called Insevec, and now it's a three-drug combination. I was the first person at Kaiser to get access to that, went through another year of treatment from summer of 2011-2012. Uh, and it worked this time, and I was cured. And uh, so, thanks, thanks. That's, yeah. So that was, I mean, that experience was a, also left a strong impression on me in terms of medical science and the drug approval process. You know, the guy that started the company, Vertex, uh, uh, he spent 20 years to bring uh, Insevec through the, the process, raised $7 billion uh, to do that. Uh, it was a long run, but he uh, is saving millions of lives as a result of that because when I started in, in 97, only a 15% cure rate, and 2004, is only up to 30 percent. Now it's up to 85, 90 percent, and they're going to get rid of interferon, and so the disease cured, right, for the world. So um, although, yes, I uh, totally support com community-based medicine and believe that it should have a place, um, still, uh, just as Rick and other colleagues and scientists would say, clinical trials and going through the rigors of those trials does have a place, a place as well. Uh, what, what, what are some statements that Donald made at one point to me was that the only way this was going to make progress was when legalization took place. So that certainly caught my attention, right, because uh, I listened to my gurus. <laughs> and so in that sense, you know, 
uh, I felt that the legalization of cannabis could facilitate it, given the overwhelming uh, political opposition that we were seeing. Uh, so uh, just to move to the end of my story here, because I'm probably about out of time, a few months ago I received a call from uh, a company called Botech Analysis Corporation. And Botech Analysis Corporation uh, is run by a gentleman, a professor at UCLA, by the name of Professor Mark Kleiman, wrote a book on uh, marijuana legalization a couple of years ago. Uh, Mark is uh, a policy person. Thank you. And uh, as you might have heard, there was an RFP put out by the state of Washington uh, after the election last November uh, to bring in a group of consultants to advise the liquor board there to uh, get some expertise in-house about the industry. And that RFP had four categories to it, product and industry. And I was brought in uh, as the team leader of, of that team. And the second category was quality and testing. Uh, David Lampack from Steep Hill Labs here in Oakland is leading that team. The third team is on uh, consumption validation, and that's being run by the guys from RAND Corporation. And the last team uh, is on regulation and policy, and that's being run by Dr. Kleiman and uh, a number of other guys from RAND and others. Uh, so. Um, Yes, we, we were all brought into place to advise the board, and part of the agenda up there you know, is how to incorporate the state-level medical marijuana system into the wider field of uh, general adult use legalization. Um, I am no longer with Botech. Um, although they got the, the contract, um, I declined to sign a contact, contract with them. Uh, for a number of reasons I might not get into here, <laughs> but uh, some of them had to do with policy disagreements with Dr. Kleiman uh, in terms of the risk evaluation of cannabis and uh, a number of other factors as well. So uh, I'm uh, now, so that's what I'm saying. I have no, uh, no pony in this race here. I don't work for any company now at all. But uh, where I'm focused right now actually is back up in Canada again because I don't know if you folks have heard what's going on there. They're restructuring the medical cannabis system there. Uh, they're going to allow commercial production facilities to come into place next year. Those uh, facilities will operate under the authority of Health Canada. Uh, the same standards that uh, PPS is being held to right now will also be applied to those organizations. But there will be competition between those commercial producers. And those commercial producers will be able to sell directly to patients right? so that they can achieve a low price point and affordability that way. I don't agree with everything uh, that Health Canada is doing up there. For example, they're withdrawing personal production licenses from patients. I don't think that they should do that, but you know, that's the decision they've made because of pressure from provincial and local government there. There's also no space really for the compassion clubs uh, because, of course, the distribution system that they're standing up is a direct uh, sale from the factory uh, right to the patient. So although that's uh, helpful for the patient in terms of prices, those patients can have access to community-based organizations for all the other services that they might provide. But again, the constituency of the compassion clubs and the constitu constituency of personal producers, right, I would say are, are, are a smaller uh, burden and a smaller constituency than the patients themselves, right? Uh, and it's also about the doctors, you know, because there's a big resistance in Canada from the uh, f uh, physicians community about prescribing there. And that's always been a really, really big problem. But the outcome of this new system will be now, the monopoly will be broken. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, uh, the response of my other presenters here because, you know, several years ago when, when I was pointed out to Alan and to Rick, that why are you persisting in you know, trying to obtain material from NIDA? You can't take it to, through the drug approval process. You're, you're very clear with everyone that that is your objective, is the FDA drug approval process. That's right on the website there, right? So if you cannot use that material to go through the drug approval process, why don't we just bring in material from the Netherlands that's commercially available for drug development? But you know, there are other motivations, of course, you know, in terms of overcoming the political log jam, making a point with the DEA, whatever th those, those reasons are. Anyways, those issues are now behind us. MAPS has now come to an end, both, both administratively and in terms of the federal court system. I don't think, uh, talking to Rick the other day, there's any further joy there. So in terms of the future, I hope that what we can do in Canada 
and I plan to participate up there, uh, is to produce a supply chain of medicinal cannabis that is research grade, that is pharmacy grade, that can be distributed by compassion clubs as well if they have the appropriate licenses to do so. Uh, I, I see this as a game-changing event in Canada because it's going to be outside of the name patient basis. It will be ordinary prescription. Health Canada really has the intention of treating this like any other medicine. And the fact that we can uh, uh, create an, a commercial framework will create the funding that will allow us to bring this from an unapproved drug product into an approved drug product, at least for those people like myself uh, who happen to need it uh, on that level of quality control. So thanks very much. So what I'd like to do is just review uh, some of the work that we've done and end by uh, telling you uh, some of the work I hope to do because probably since the last time you heard me, I haven't done anything new in this field, uh, but I do have a few uh, irons in the fire. So uh, again, as we all know from the story, it was uh, Rick Doblin sending a letter uh, to the AIDS program in 1992 after Mary Rathbun, a.k.a. Brownie Mary, was arrested in uh, in Sonoma for making brownies for our AIDS patients uh, that uh, inspired me uh, through Rick's uh, persistence uh, to uh, take on uh, the challenge of trying to investigate uh, cannabis as medicine. And this is a headline from one of our local uh, gay papers back in 1994, uh, uh, which really is, again, what prompted uh, this work because so many of the patients with HIV AIDS that I was caring for uh, were using cannabis. So uh, Rick's uh, first effort that we tried to collaborate on was a forearm uh, comparative outpatient evaluation of three different strengths of inhaled THC that he was going to get from uh, the Netherlands uh, versus dronabinol in patients with the AIDS wasting syndrome. And of course that opened up all sorts of cans of worms because we couldn't import cannabis from across international borders without the U.S. saying it was okay, and they wouldn't say it was okay until the Dutch said it was okay to export it. So it was a big catch-22 that uh, wasn't going to work at all. And then ultimately, uh, Alan Leshner said that the, this, uh, the science was not uh, there, and that if we proposed something that was favorably peer-reviewed, he would consider providing cannabis for it. So we did another much more elegant study that we submitted to NIDA in 1996. Uh, which is when I finally learned that NIDA has a congressional mandate to only study substances of abuse as substances of abuse. So as long as I was going to request to study cannabis for its potential therapeutic effectiveness, they couldn't fund it, which is what I was asking for, uh, but they could probably give cannabis uh, to another uh, source. So in 97, when the terrain changed in HIV, uh, when we got the availability of uh, protease inhibitors, which were effective drugs, a new window of opportunity opened, as Clint called it the other night. He said I did a Trojan horse uh, proposal. Uh, with protease inhibitors, there was an early report that somebody died of an overdose of ecstasy mixed with the protease inhibitor because they're both metabolized by the same pathway in the liver. And in checking, cannabinoids are also metabolized by the same liver enzyme system. So we proposed a study in 97 to NIDA to look at the safety of using inhaled cannabis in patients on protease inhibitors. And we were going to compare that uh, to uh, the oral uh, dronabinol, which was licensed and available. And it does turn out that the particular protease inhibitors that we were uh, saying we wanted to investigate back then, which are really no longer used anymore, uh, were uh, metabolized by the same enzyme systems uh, that metabolize some of the uh, cannabinoids uh, in cannabis. So the original objective of our first study that we ever did back in 97 was to determine the safety and the toxicity of cannabinoids in patients with HIV on protease inhibitors, asking the question whether there was a metabolic interaction between the cannabinoids and the protease inhibitors or possibly between the cannabinoids and the patient's immune system that might alter the level of the AIDS virus in their bloodstream after 21 days of exposure. And if there is such a difference, does it matter whether the uh, cannabinoids are inhaled or ingested by mouth? And as long as we're going to have patients in our clinical research center 
basically incarcerated for 25 days, we were going to look at some uh, effectiveness endpoints as well, including uh, caloric intake, uh, body weight, uh, etc. So this was a prospective, randomized, partially blinded placebo-controlled trial in that patients who were smoking cannabis knew that they were smoking a real cannabis cigarette. <coughs> patients receiving a pill didn't know if they were getting the dronabinol, two and a half milligrams, or the dronabinol placebo. And they were exposed to whichever arm they were randomized to three times a day for 21 days. And at the end of the, uh, well, the, again, what we looked at was the level of the AIDS virus, the level of the protease inhibitors, and immune function, doing probably the most sophisticated battery of immune tests uh, in response to cannabis that's ever been done. And the activity parameters, again, as I mentioned, uh, were things that we sort of snuck in there just to see if there was any potential benefit. Now, all the, all the cannabis that comes from NIDA comes pre-rolled in Pall Mall rolling papers. <laughs> They each weigh about a, a gram, each of the cigarettes, and they're, they're, they're sent to us in a, in a sort of a coffee tin, uh, standing upright, and they're not twisted off at the end. Uh, the cannabis is freeze-dried, uh, so it sort of flakes out, and, but it's, a, it's close to the gram that they thought they were. And to standardize inhalation, uh, we use the famous Fulton puff procedure. <laughs> which you see here, uh, because we do want to, you know, have the benefit of appearing that we're using, and this is the standard sort of procedure that's suggested to use in studies of inhaled cannabis. And then we have a nurse who uh, views the patient, usually with the blind up, uh, in, the, in, <clears throat> in the room in our clinical research center. Uh, we have the room is vented to the outside with a fan, but unfortunately this is San Francisco General Hospital, so the door in the hallway is about an inch off the floor. So the nurses would roll up uh, blankets and put them outside the patient's door while they were smoking, sort of the opposite of college, is what I always say. <laughs> so at the end of the day, uh, I don't know, is this a pointer? No. At the end of the day, uh, you can see the top line is the level of the patient's viral load, the change in their viral load. And in all three arms, there was no change in the level of the AIDS virus in the patients after 21 days of exposure. Interestingly, those CD4 cells, which are the helper T lymphocytes, the cells that get infected by HIV and diminished, actually increased in the ca cannabinoid groups, both in the marijuana and in the uh, dronabinol. The CD8 cells, which are the suppressor cells which fight virally infected cells and cancer cells were markedly increased, statistically so, in the cannabis group. Uh, also increased in the dronabinol group, but not as much. And in contrast to the prior study of dronabinol, which showed uh, that it increased appetite but not weight, our patients after 21 days gained 3.2 kilos, a kilo being 2.2 pounds, so about 7 pounds, and the cannabis group gained a little over 6.5 pounds, uh, whereas the placebo group also gained weight, but not as much as the group receiving the cannabinoids. So we concluded from that study that cannabinoids both smoked and oral uh, didn't alter levels of the AIDS virus, and we saw no significant adverse effect on the immune system. If anything, there might have been a, a benefit and no clinically significant interaction between uh, cannabinoids and the protease inhibitors, uh, and we saw the significant uh, weight gain. So the next, uh, we've heard uh, from uh, Senator John, the uh, Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research was f funded and founded, much uh, gratitude for the work that he did to get that done, and <clears throat> the real goal of that center was to make it easy for us to be able to jump through all the hoops that we needed to jump through that I had trouble with in my first study uh, to obtain cannabis and approvals from all the regulatory agencies we needed to deal with. And so with funding from the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, I conducted, uh, I was awarded four different clinical trials and only completed two of them because for some re reason I've had difficulty enrolling cancer patients in cannabis clinical trials in San Francisco. Why that is, is we can discuss uh, perhaps later. But, but the study uh, that we're very proud of uh, was a study looking at uh, cannabis in patients with HIV-related painful peripheral nerve damage or peripheral neuropathy. 
this was a problem in the past uh, due to the infection with the virus itself and the drugs that we use to treat it. Opiates were generally ineffective. Many people were treated with anticonvulsants, which also had side effects and might interfere with the HIV meds. And we knew two things. Number one, from an animal model of neuropathic pain, which is the so-called rat tail flick model, uh, that cannabinoids are effective in that model of neuropathic pain. And we also got from patients reports that, gee, cannabis seems to work in this condition. So first we did a 16-patient open-label study where we brought patients to our clinical research center and everybody smoked real cannabis three times a day for a week, and we found that it decreased their pain. So with that information, we were able to calculate, calculate the sample size that we would need to do a follow-on placebo-controlled trial where half of the patients smoked cannabis and the other half smoked cannabis placebo, both from NIDA. Now, how could you blind cannabis, one would ask. Now, remember, the strength of the potency of NIDA's cannabis is 3.5% THC. So that's a bit low. And <clears throat> the cannabinoids are removed, uh, but the terpenoids and flavonoids, which provide much of the smell, remain. So just smelling it, you can't really tell. And second of all, if you just do the Fulton Puff procedure yourself, inhale for five, hold it for 10, and repeat that a few times, you get a little something just by doing that. So, you know, we did do this uh, clinical trial in a double-blind fashion. And my colleagues from the Payne Clinical Research Center felt that we needed to have a more objective anchor of the patient's pain besides their report of their peripheral neuropathy pain because people who were, you know, reviewing our manuscript would say, well, gee, you, you enrolled a lot of people who want to see cannabis become a medicine, and they're going to be able to tell if they're on placebo or real, so the real people will say, oh, my pain went down, and the placebo people will say, I had no effect. So we did a, an experimental pain model to do something more objective. We heated the forearm a patch uh, with a thermode uh, to 40 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes and then applied capsaicin cream, which is the ingredient in chili peppers, uh, to the same heated patch. And that creates an area of funny feeling and hypersensitivity around that rectangle that you can map out while the person is looking off in another direction before and after exposure to the analgesic. And you can assess by how big the area of hypesthesia and allodynia are, whether or not your intervention has been effective. So we use this experimental pain model uh, in our study as well. The results of this study are shown here. Patients were asked to keep a diary of their pain for the week before they came into the hospital. Their pain averaged about 60 on a scale of 0 to 100. And for the first two days, they were just in the hospital without any smoking, and their pain went down a little bit. So it was about 52 and 53 in the placebo <clears throat> and the uh, cannabis groups. The bottom line is what happened when patients smoked the cannabis. And you can see uh, what we chose as a uh, evidence that the drug was working was a reduction of 30% in their pain level. And 54% of the cannabis smokers had that 30% reduction compared to 24% of the uh, participants who smoked placebo. The top left shows you what happened after smoking the first cannabis cigarette to the neuropathic pain. The placebo group had a 19% decrease in their pain. The group smoking the actual cannabis had a 74% decrease. And the bottom two panels show what happened to that area of funny feeling in the experimental pain model. The top line is the placebo group, and you can see that the area either stayed the same or actually increased, whereas the bottom line was the group smoking cannabis, and you can see that in the experimental pain model, that also was reduced about 30%, the same as what we saw uh, in the uh, peripheral neur neuropathic pain. So we concluded that smoked cannabis is an effective treatment in patients with painful HIV-related peripheral neuropathy. And remember, the definition of a Schedule One substance is it has no uh, reported medical use. Uh, the CMCR funded three other studies looking at uh, smoke cannabis in peripheral neuropathy, and all of them demonstrated the same improvement. And what's more interesting is that 
to calculate the magnitude of the pain reduction, we, we calculate something called the number needed to treat. So how many people do we need to treat for one to have a benefit? And for cannabis and peripheral neuropathy from our study, it's 3.6. From two other studies in HIV peripheral neuropathy, it was 3.5 and 3.7. So that's really consistent for studies done at three different places in three different populations of patients. So I think that, you know, cannabis for peripheral neuropathy uh, is uh, definitely something that works. And Mark Ware, previously mentioned, has done a study in Canada in patients with um, post-traumatic neuropathic pain and finds the same. So <clears throat> the next study we did was to address the concern of the Institute of Medicine report, Marijuana as Medicine, that came out in 1999, that said there is data that suggests that cannabis has some utility, uh, but uh, studies should be done uh, to uh, develop of a non-smoked rapid onset cannabinoid delivery system. So we took that to heart, and the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research uh, then uh, funded us uh, in looking at uh, the uh, vaporization of cannabis uh, through uh, the uh, volcano vaporizer. Uh, this is basically a heating device with a fan. The cannabis is put in the chamber, and it blows up that balloon, uh, which can then be inhaled. And uh, vapors are cooler, purer, and probably less uh, toxic than smoke. And there may be more psychoactivity as less of the THC is combusted. So this is very busy, but this was the easiest study I've ever done. We enrolled 25 to 40-year-old chronic marijuana smokers. We put them in our general clinical research center for six days. And on each of those six days, they either vaporized or smoked half of a night a cigarette of three different strengths, 1.7, 3.4, and 6.8% THC. This first panel is the level of THC in the bloodstream. You can see that they're superimposable. The second panel shows expired carbon monoxide, which is a measure of exposure to noxious gases. The bottom line that doesn't change is the vaporized group. The top line where you do have increased expired carbon monoxide are the people smoking the cannabis cigarette. The last panel shows the patients reported high. And the, the journal almost didn't want to publish this because they wanted to know how I validated that scale, you know, which was very difficult. But you can see that the reported highs are also superimposable. So we concluded that uh, vaporization of cannabis is safe and effective. The plasma THC levels are comparable, the physiologic effects are comparable, and expired carbon monoxide is decreased. And when we asked patients which day they preferred, 14 out of 20 chose a day where they actually vaporized. And that could be because the night of cannabis is uh, dehydrated, needs to be rehydrated, and is very harsh when smoked as a cigarette. So our next studies then uh, are all going to use uh, vaporization as a delivery system as opposed to uh, combustion. So the, the last study that I, that I want to report on is, is one that I think is very important and it's looking at the potential interaction between cannabinoids and opioids because in mice and rat, THC greatly enhances the analgesic effect of morphine in a synergistic fashion. So one plus one equals five, not two. And cannabinoids and opioids interact with different receptors in the brain to bring about uh, decreased pain. So there is a possibility if you add cannabinoids to opioids that you can get away with a lower dose of opioids for a longer period of time and get sustained pain relief. So the study we did, uh, we enrolled patients with chronic pain on a stable dose of sustained release morphine or sustained release oxycodone in our general clinical research center. And on the first day, we drew their blood level of their opiate. And then on the next day, they were able to uh, inhale cannabis vaporize three times a day. And on day five, the last day of the study, we redrew the level of the opioids in their bloodstream. We enrolled 10 patients on the sustained release morphine and 11 on oxycodone. To do a pharmacokinetic interaction study, you don't need more than 10 patients. The average dose of morphine was 60 milligrams twice a day. The oxycodone sustained release was 50 milligrams twice a day. And you can see the pain scores were slightly lower in the morphine cohort compared to the oxycodone group. 
Now this shows the level of the uh, morphine in the blood. The top line is the first day, and the second line is after exposure to cannabis. And you can see that the plasma level of the morphine is actually slightly decreased. The, this curve shows the oxycodone, and you can see that over the course of the five days, or the, between day one and five, there's no real change in the level of oxycodone. So with a potential decrease in the blood level or the same level, you would expect that pain would either go up or stay the same. And what we actually saw was overall patients came in with an average pain score of 40 and it dropped to 29. That's a 25% reduction and that was statistically significant. The pain reduction was greater in the morphine group where it was 33% reduced than it was in the oxycodone group where it was 20%. But the, the numbers here are too small to really say anything about pain. But we did conclude that co-administration of vaporized cannabis with oral sustained release opiates is safe and appears to enhance the uh, analgesic effect. And if that happened, it's not a pharmacokinetic interaction. That is, it's not through increasing the plasma levels of the opiates. It's a so-called pharmacodynamic uh, interaction. And, and I believe that this small study actually changed some policy because prior to this study, uh, I'm aware that the VA and the Department of Defense would not provide chronic pain patients with opiates if they had a positive test for cannabis in their urine, whereas now they do. In fact, they might not even test, I'm not sure, but <clears throat> I was happy with that. So what's next on the wish list? Actually, I was visited by uh, a basic science investigator from the University of Minnesota about two years ago who has a mouse model of sickle cell disease. And she said these mice are very responsive to cannabinoids with regards to decreasing pain, inflammation, and progression of disease. And so she wanted to submit a large grant to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and she asked if I would write a human clinical trial to be part of this submission. And we did. And National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute wanted to fund seven centers, and she got the third best score. And we had a phone call with NHLBI program people asking if we could perhaps get less money so that they could fund more centers. And the council met, and we were just about to get funded starting on April 1st when sequestration happened. So in this study, I'm hoping to do use a CBD THC blend. And I've called NIDA and Dr. El Sule, and they do have about a 5% THC, 5% CBD blend that we can use in this study because I'm not sure if it's THC or CBD that's going to be working the best here. <clears throat> With one of my neuro-oncologists, uh, this is in the O'Shaughnessy's paper, it's sort of two steps ahead of where we are in reality, but he and I, uh, the, one of the neuro-oncologists at UCSF says the only thing that that unifies all of his long-standing glioblastoma multiforme, or brain tumor patients, is that they all use cannabis. Uh, so we are going to propose a clinical trial looking at cannabis oil to see if there's an interaction between cannabis oil and the chemotherapy that we use in treating brain tumors. That study, <clears throat> again, is just in the development phase. Uh, again, they do have cannabis oil at NIDA now because Dr. El Sule from Mississippi donated some so that we could use it for our study, but as yet, that cannabis oil has not been used in humans. So whether or not I'm going to have to jump through hoops to show that cannabis oil is safe when everybody in California and Colorado and every place else is already using it is something that, that I don't know. Then we need to do the, the definitive cannabinoid opioid interaction study with pain as the endpoint, not the opioid levels. And finally, yeah. I, I can cure many patients with cancer who remain disabled because they have peripheral neuropathy from the chemotherapy we use. And one of my colleagues, Andrea Holman at the University of Indiana, has a mouse model of chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy that's sensitive to cannabis. That is, cannabis not only treats it, but seems to protect the mice from developing it. So if I wasn't having difficulties enrolling cancer patients in clinical trials, I would have done this one quite a long time ago. So that's my wish list uh, for the upcoming years. I'm still going to 
continue to do this uh, in answer to sort of Michael's questions, why do this if it's not going to be developed as a drug? I think it's to develop the database that shows that we in fact help people. And as a doctor, as an oncologist, that's sort of my credo. That's what I need to do. And first, do no harm. So thank you for your attention. Thank you all for coming on this really exquisitely beautiful Bay Area Day. It's good to see a nice gathering like this. And I'd like to thank MAPS for inviting me to speak about marijuana and uh, better health. Um, I think I'll start out talking about cancer and then maybe move into Alzheimer's and a couple of other things if there's time. Because this is really a fascinating field. It is so amazing what we're learning when you look back at the point we've come from, um, say during the 60, late 60s through the 70s, um, when there was a little respite in the war on drugs and cannabis, to the 80s when Reagan relaunched the Nixon's war on cannabis and drugs in general with renewed gusto. And through that whole time, and then Bush and Clinton to here, What's really amazing is what the science has started telling us about this plant and what it does with human biology, how it interacts with us, because there's a long, long thousand plus year history, thousands of years plus history of using this plant as a medicinal agent for a whole host of ailments that um, have plagued humanity. And that was dismissed through prohibition, and they tried to bury it, but it wouldn't go. So we've revived it, and we've established a whole new branch of biological science that has uh, arisen from studying what cannabis does for human health and to the human uh, bio biological organism. Um, back in the early 70s, um, there was a study that was done, it was actually about 74, and this was at UVA, University of Virginia, uh, Charlottesville, and it was an effort uh, to sort of find out how carcinogenic marijuana is, how dangerous THC is, and to, in general, I suspect, to generate propaganda to use to justify the um, uh, war on cannabis. And the results were pretty shocking. It was uh, Munson et al. Uh, was, Munson was the lead researcher. And what they found was that when they implanted rats and mice with lung tumor cells and then dosed them with a variety of cannabinoids, CBN, THC, CBD, in general, the uh, dosed rats and mice had a longer survival rate and had a proportionate decrease in tumor viability. Um, this was pretty shocking because they had anticipated, I think, in finding the opposite. And there was also some other changes that seemed to suggest that uh, the cannabinoids might inhibit uh, certain types of leukemia. Uh, this was a pretty amazing study, and unfortunately, because of this whole um, marijuana phobia milieu that uh, we were entrenched in then, it was dropped. It was never taken and exploited and pursued. And when we stop and think about that, 1975 to today, all the misery and suffering and possible premature deaths that have resulted from that, it just seems like such a terrible, terrible example of human folly. So basically, nothing really happened with cannabis and cancer other than um, innuendo and deceit being uh, promulgated by the anti-drug agencies that claim it causes lung cancer, uh, destroys the immune system, which will promote all forms of cancer. And then, sort of simultaneous to the mapping, the discovery and mapping of the endocannabinoid receptors, the first receptor was discovered in 1988, uh, the CB1 receptor, and that was plotted primarily in the central nervous system. And then there was another cannabinoid receptor uh, located and found to be expressed in primarily immune tissue and organ tissue. And I believe it was about 95 that it was found in spleen tissue. And I actually remember when that study came through because it was very confusing. We didn't expect to find a cannabinoid receptor in spleen tissue. And so that was all going on. And this whole 
uh, new uh, pursuit was uh, being followed, this whole uh, new line of um, research into where these receptors are, where they're expressed, and what they do in conjunction with human health and biology. And so in Madrid, there was a researcher, there is a researcher, Manuel Guzman and his team, and they were researching the metabolism of brain cells and what different compounds do to brain cell metabolism. And because the CB1 receptor had been found in brain tissue, that was one thing they wanted to look at, what THC does to brain cells. Now, to buy brain cells that are harvested from rats and mice, astrocytes, is incredibly expensive because they have to be harvested from these rats and preserved and transported. Whereas if you have um, astrocytoma, which are brain, a form of brain cancer cells, they rapidly uh, proliferate and you can get a line of these cells and basically produce your own research material without having to keep paying for newly harvested ones. So you have a nice regular supply of research material. So they were using these astrocytomas to try and see how THC affected um, brain cell metabolism. But as they said, they couldn't do a single study because every time they exposed these cancer cells to THC, they all died. They were, you know, you're wanting to do your research, you start to do it, boom, your research material dissipates, dies off, collapses. And so, very intelligently and um, admirably, they dropped the uh, metabolism research and shifted right over into cancer research to see what this is about, why is this happening? And they went and they looked at the, uh, the um, research material, the previous body of data, and the only thing they could find was the Munson study that was published in 75. So they started pursuing this line and looking at what THC and CBD and synthetic cannabinoids do in terms of um, these brain cancer cells, and they were looking at glioblastoma cells too, and they found that it's quite amazing that THC attacks selectively the brain tumor cells and changes basically the signaling within the cell to change its viability. It seems that uh, THC is, what someone said, a circuit breaker. It intercalates in with the signaling process and reverses the production of pro-cancer chemicals and increases the production of um, anti-tumor chemicals so that the cells collapse and die. And this is selective to the tumor cells. So this research was pretty amazing. They continued to look at this and pursue this and see how it works. And then other researchers decided to pick it up and started looking at other forms of cancer. And throughout the world, research has been done in Italy, Israel, Germany, very many places. And what uh, Thailand, they have found is that cannabinoids are very effective for pancreatic tumor cells. Um, uh, colon cancer cells, breast cancer cells, um, bile duct cancer cells, and melanoma cells. So there is this really amazing effect of cannabinoids selectively attacking cancer cells, um, triggering what's called apoptosis, which is the dying off process, and actually in possibly even enhancing the health of the surrounding tissue. So this material has been growing and growing and growing, and researchers have been exploiting it. And on the other hand, there's sort of the guerrilla movement of people having heard that this is happening, that these uh, compounds have anti-tumor effects, and beginning to try and see if they could use them for health. And there's some interesting pathology coming out. It's all anecdotal at this point, and it's all underground because this research can't really be done very easily, and it's certainly not being facilitated in the way it should. It's being suppressed. But there's a lot of um, anecdotal stories coming up of people who are using concentrated cannabis oils uh, where a whole massive amount of cannabis is concentrated in to a viscous, um, thick oil, 
and you're able to dose yourself regularly with it and flood your system with these cannabinoids and really let, let them have the ability that there's enough volume to attack the cancer cells and either slow tumor growth, stunt tumor growth, or even reverse tumor growth. And in the O'Shaughnessy's uh, paper, which is available here at the back, there's the uh, story of Michelle Aldridge, and she seems to have had complete remission using cannabis oil and some dietary changes from lung cancer. And there are more and more of these stories coming up. I know um, I've heard of an, another patient who's had a remission, surprising remission, using a grain of cannabis oil, a rice grain size dose um, in the evening. And so this is something I think we really need to talk about and get out and push because there's no reason we shouldn't have something akin to a Manhattan Project to establish what the appropriate dosage is, how to deliver it, what the ratio of cannabinoids works best for what cancers, and stop alleviating so much human misery and grief because these things really do seem to have potential. Now, what's also interesting is that some of the actions of uh, cannabinoids against cancer involve reducing inflammation, um, attenuating the production of uh, compounds in the body that produce inflammation like cytokines and nitric acid, and as I said, stimulating the production of more healthful, nurturing chemicals in the body. And this also involves the decrease of harmful oxidation and another aspect where cannabinoids work is in modulating our immune response, sort of um, almost acting like a referee to regulate how our immune system responds to different challenges that we have in day-to-day -day life and through our genetics. And that's also interesting is that it seems that cannabinoids are be we were beginning to understand that they actually influence the expression of genes. And this is, I, I want to get more into this and learn more about it, but it, epigenetic um, influence on our biology. So that's another avenue to think about. But what we see with this reduction in inflammation and oxidation and also the immune modulation is that it doesn't just work with cancer. This is um, apparently the foundation of many of the illnesses from which we're suffering. And um, one of those is Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, which can result from a variety of causes, but primarily aging, um, perhaps genetic influences. But the destruction of our cognitive ability through dementia, through Alzheimer's, does involve inflammation and oxidation. And so there is a growing body of evidence that cannabinoids stop these processes that they, by intercalating with our cannabinoid receptors and matching up and adjusting the uh, activity of them, that they lower the activity that leads to uh, Alzheimer's and protects us from the cellular changes. And we also have seen that these um, changes also seem to work in rats and mice, that they seem to for perform better cognitively um, when they receive cannabinoids. And Dr. Gary Wink has been doing a lot of this research, and uh, it's, I love the progression of his um, his conclusions because initially he downplayed the idea that someone might be able to use uh, marijuana to protect themselves from Alzheimer's disease and then he did more research and he began to come around a little and he says you know it might be possible that someone could use uh, THC marijuana if they have a family history to protect themselves now he's gone so far as to say a puff is enough one puff of marijuana every day is enough to offer significant protection from the degenerative process that accompanies the aging brain that leads to dementia through Alzheimer's disease. And his uh, lab actually has a t-shirt uh, that they wear that says a puff is enough. And so that's their motto. And I'm willing to go with a doc. And so there's this huge wave of dementia that's 
facing America and is coming at us. And it makes, it, you know, it, it's a form of mental illness to pretend that this evidence doesn't exist and it's not um, uh, something that we should explore and embrace and exploit to help uh, ourselves and our fellow human beings. Because Alzheimer's dementia is really, I think, one of the worst things that can happen to someone. My mother's experiencing it. And you just lose your ability to have reference points for the incidents that happened in your life, the people you interact with, um, what your passions, what your skills were all dissolve away until you lose your ability to function. And usually they, people die from choking on their own saliva or from bed sores from being restrained. And it's a terrible, terrible illness for the patient and for the families. And it is hugely expensive to manage this disease. And it makes me crazy that I am too scared of going to prison in North Carolina to send my mother a box of marijuana cookies or a jar of tincture and you know, have to deal with it. There's no reason that we shouldn't be able to provide this for our loved ones. And it's criminal. The people who oppose this, I think, are just scoundrels. Um, so in the last few minutes I have, I also just wanted to mention that one thing I find really interesting that wasn't presented for my agenda is diabetes. There's recent studies coming out that show that chronic long-term marijuana smokers have a significant reduction in their incidence of diabetes compared to people who don't use marijuana. Once again, diabetes, a product of abnormal um, inflammation, harmful inflammation and oxidation. These processes uh, attack the cells that are responsible for modulating um, the production of uh, a response to in, uh, sugars with insulin production. And in this, uh, in this realm, it's also interesting that there's significant evidence that uh, long-term chronic marijuana smokers have a significant protection from obesity, much lower rates of obesity significantly lower rates of obesity than the general public, which speaks to the ability of cannabinoids to modulate our immune response, to modulate how our body actually processes sugars and deals with excess sugar and how it affects our health to shield us from the harm that these substances causes. And that's what we see again and again and again is that THC, CBD, and the other cannabinoids along with the flavonoids and the terpenes make this really amazing natural cocktail of healing protective compounds that enhance not only our health, but also our experience of life. You know, our opponents often talk about these horrible, it causes depression and, and um, lack of... Uh, focus and disorientation. And you know what? That is the rare exception. There's a reason we call it getting high, because it elevates mood and it elevates health. And we're, we're just not going to get away from this. The studies are going to keep coming in that show that you have a lower rate of cancer, you have a lower rate of diabetes, you have lower rates of Alzheimer's disease if you use cannabis, marijuana, on a regular basis. And the harms that result from that are just not going to turn out to be significant enough to keep us from embracing it as an effective medicine and protective agent. Thank you. All right. Hi, you guys. My name is Sue Sisley. I'm a physician from Arizona. And I'm on faculty at the U of A, the University of Arizona College of Medicine. And one of my academic pursuits there is I am a principal investigator on a marijuana study looking at combat veterans who have PTSD. And I'm going to fly through these slides and try to get to, um, you know, because I know we've covered a lot of this material about the NIDA monopoly. And I want to talk about um, what we're doing to try to get around that. So um, just full disclosure, I don't have any personal experience with marijuana. I'm not part of the industry. I don't write certifications. I'm squarely focused on trying to do marijuana research. 
And um, we talked a lot about the scheduling of drugs. I wanted to dig a little bit deeper with you because we all know that Schedule 1 means no medical value and high addiction potential. What's interesting, though, for Schedule 4, if you guys look here, Schedule 4 presumably then is um, is high medical value and very little abuse potential. And you can see the schedule for you got Ambien and Xanax and all these drugs that we all know are, are hugely addictive. And so it just points to the absurdity of this scheduling and the, the problem with having law enforcement defining the scheduling is, is really um, is really ridiculous, and we, we know that if medical professionals were doing this, it would be scheduled a lot differently. Um, this is, um, when we talk about the NIDA monopoly, um, it, it's, this is a very, really frustrating obstruction that has limited our ability to implement this study that I'm going to be describing to you. Um, and what's, what's surprising is marijuana is the only Schedule One drug that has to endure this second review by NIDA. So if, if you want to do a study on LSD or MDMA, you just get um, your FDA approval and IRB approval and you move forward. So if NIDA decides not to sell you study drug, they effectively derail your study. You just can't, uh, you can't implement it. And um, it, what a lot of people don't realize that when I send a, a study design to the FDA, they have to respond in a 30-day timetable. But NIDA has no such timetable. So they can take 10 months or 10 years. And that's the way they can kind of put your study in a permanent review process and it never emerges. And that's a uh, this is, um, I wanted to just mention the, how much mainstream media attention we're getting around this issue. Now, a lot of the media is paying attention to the fact that this study is being suppressed and they're really doing a nice job of highlighting the injustice of that. Uh, the reason we want to study this is because we know how many people in, in the U.S. are plagued by PTSD. We know how many combat vets are coming back with PTSD and we know, see here, the amount of disability payouts just for 2010, um, and in 2012, we're expecting this number to be much, much higher. So it's, it's clearly a big economic issue for the U.S. also. And this is showing, media is really starting to point up the problems that, you know, vets are not responding to conventional meds that we're offering them. They're still agonizing with, with, and very, very symptomatic because the only two FDA-approved meds for PTSD or Zoloft and Paxil, and we all know how um, disappointing those meds are. They have a ton of side effects, including sexual dysfunction and weight gain, and for vets who are trying to you know, reintegrate into normal family life, that can be terribly onerous for them. So um, the uh, real, um, I think that what spurred the study on more than anything, though, was that unbelievable um, the enormity of anecdotal reports that we were getting from our veterans who were talking about what excellent experiences they were having with cannabis and many of them were able to walk away from their old FDA approved meds that weren't working for them and so it's been really heartening to see how many vets are going on record and talking about their experience now they're having the courage to step out of the shadows and say uh, publicly that this is the only thing that has helped them. All these you know, painkillers and antidepressants that we're pummeling them with have done nothing, and suddenly they've discovered cannabis, and it's been really life-changing for them. And um, there are no other um, real, you know, randomized controlled trials looking at um, treating combat vets with PTSD in human subjects. It's, this would be the first and only one of its kind. So we're really excited to be able to get this going eventually. And this is just for those of you who haven't seen the timeline of how these studies get implemented. Um, this study was approved exactly two years ago. So um, the FDA gave it its stamp of approval two years ago and it's still just sitting in the pipeline waiting to get moving. Um, the same day we got FDA approval, we submitted to the DEA and the Public Health Service for their review, and we're still um, trying to get the green light from them. This is Dr. El Soli, the guy who runs the NIDA 
production facility at the University of Mississippi, and he's got his hand in a, you know, a barrel of ground up marijuana, and that's exactly what they do. They literally take the entire plant, throw it in a grinder, and what you're left with then are these rolled up cigarettes, and if you dump out the contents, you'll see that it's mostly stems, sticks, and leaves. There's not a lot of the, you know, therapeutic bud material. So a lot of people argue that if you're trying to do an efficacy study like what we're doing, um, that this kind of already sabotages it right from the beginning because you're stuck with, you know, these cigarettes get mailed out to investigators by weight. So you can imagine if each cigarette is about a gram and half of the cigarette is, is a bunch of extraneous material that doesn't, it's not really highly therapeutic, it really can sabotage the results right away. Um, so our hypothesis, of course, is that we believe marijuana will ease the symptoms of PTSD in a dose-dependent manner. So the higher the, the dose of the active ingredient, the, the better the patient's response. And we also think that um, the, there's one arm of the study that looks at 6% THC and 6% CBD. And that was a really important part of uh, what we were challenging NIDA to see if they could produce that. And we're really excited to see the results of that arm of the study. So this is the breakdown on what the study looks like. So you can see there's five different dosage arms. It includes a placebo control. A lot of you guys might not know that they actually, NIDA offers a placebo control, 0% THC that is like alcohol while they leach out all the THC, it looks indistinguishable from the real plant. And um, and then what's going to happen, so they have all these other dosage arms that they might be randomized into. Um, the highest one you can see is 12% THC. And then we have the 6% THC, 6% CBD. So what's going to happen is these patients are going to be allowed to, to they, they're basically going to be enrolled into a four-week home self-administration period here. So they get randomized into one of these dosages and they will be able to titrate the dose at home to manage their symptoms. Nobody's arguing that marijuana is a cure for PTSD. We're simply arguing that it's a very effective symptom control. And that's the idea is if we, if we force people, um, you know, patients in the study to take the full dose every day, um, that might be really unethical for patients who are, might be marijuana naive. Uh, if they get randomized into a 12% THC and they're required required to smoke a full two cigarettes a day. We want people to have the power to manage their own dose. We want this to be like a real world study. That's part of the pushback that we're getting from NIDA. Then just so you know, one of their big criticisms is they don't want this, um, they don't want patients to have the power to adjust their own dose. They don't want it to be in a home environment because they think that's really dangerous, that the drug might actually get diverted. Um, and we all know there's no marijuana anywhere except in this study, so it would be really scary if it got out. And then, um, <laughs> so what they're going to do, after, after they finish the four weeks of stage one, they, get, they go into a two-week abstinence period where they actually, we're going to be continuing to monitor the their symptoms actively with the cap scales and all these different um, measurement tools that we have. We'll be monitoring their cannabidiol blood levels. We'll be checking their young drug screen to make sure they're not um, using any other illicit drugs. And then they'll go back, they'll be re-randomized into stage two, which is another four weeks of home self-administration. But the good thing this time is that they're going to be re-randomized into some higher dosages. So if they got randomized into 2% THC and they didn't have any response, then the beauty is that they'll get randomized, hopefully maybe into 12% THC, and we'll be able to analyze all that data later and see who did well getting re-randomized. And, um, and so this crossover is really important. Um, you can see they're actually going to be also randomized into two different delivery methods, right? So it'll either be a smoke delivery or vaporized. And basically, you know, the vaporizer, you know, they're going to dump the cigarette material into their vaporizer, and we're hoping to get a better understanding of how um, patients are going to work with the vapor. This is, um, I'll show you, this is the safety um, the, the safety parameters that the FDA asked us to implement. Um, so we have basically are going to be giving everybody a lockbox. So they're going to be required to store their study drug in this lockbox. They're going to get a video camera, and we're going to ask each 
participant to have a secondary verifier where they'll be videotaping each session of the drug delivery and will be required to review all the video to ensure that no study drug was diverted at any point <laughs> during the sessions. And then, um, and, and then what's going to happen is let me show you this. Oh, well, actually, let me just go back to it. So this was really, um, these were some of the concessions that we made to get FDA approval, and it seemed really um, simple things that we could do, simple interventions to make them happy. It made our IRB happy. So the Institutional Review Board at the University of Arizona, after about you know, five, six months of back and forth um, wrangling, questioning various parts of the protocol, the UVA did approve the study. So now we have FDA approval, we have university IRB approval, and we're just waiting for NIDA to sell a study drug. So what's frustrating is, um, you know, we all know how important this study is. We all want this to be implemented, um, but we just keep banging our head against this NIDA monopoly. And so in an effort to try to get some, you know, somewhat empowered and, and feel like we can change uh, public policy a little bit, we decided to create this PAC called Americans for Scientific Freedom. And what we've done over the last year is really try to work with elected, build relationships with elected officials by selectively targeting various um, lawmakers who could help us with this with this movement. And so we're squarely focused on eliminating barriers to marijuana research. And I'll give you some examples of some initiatives that we've, we've um, been working on over the last year. So last year in Arizona, for instance, which has happened in many other states now, is that marijuana has been banned from all the university campuses. And, um, and it, it was sort of maybe an unintentional consequence that they also banned marijuana research then. If you're not allowed to have marijuana on campus, you also shut down any potential to do research. So we submitted this bill, worked with our Republican legislators in Arizona to get them to support this concept, and are requesting an exception to the ban for marijuana research that's been FDA approved, IRB approved, DEA approved, so that we can bring that back on campus. Because what happened was, after they banned uh, marijuana and, and we were looking for a new home for this research, I went around to all the you know, landlords in the private sector asking, hey, can we do marijuana research here? And they kind of, you know, you can imagine the response was not warmly embraced. Everybody's, you know, terrified of hosting a study like this, even though they don't realize that, you know, a federally regulated study is legal. They don't see it as any different than um, the medical marijuana program. So, um, so hopefully, this looks like this bill is going to pass, and the governor of Arizona has already gone on record to say she will sign it. So it's already passed the Senate. It's flying through the House right now. It looks good. So this is one of our efforts. Um, just so you, oh yeah, thank you guys, thank you. And so, just so you guys know, um, we actually we have a decent funding base for this pack already. But our problem is that we can't give at the level that would attract attention of elected officials unless we become a super PAC. So we're trying to let everybody know that if you're inter if you care about this issue, anything you can, the, the best thing you can do to help would be go on our website. Uh, if you, we need to collect $10 donations, 500 separate donations of 10 bucks a piece and we become a super PAC and then we can give at a much higher level. And so um, that, that would be a big start. It would, it would be the first, you know, marijuana research PAC to become a super PAC. This is what the website looks like if you get a chance to hop on there. And um, this is another effort. We've been working with organized medicine in Arizona, which is really conservative doctors from all over the state that are, you know, we, we're slowly moving the needle with them where they didn't even understand the importance of marijuana research until our medical marijuana program got approved in Arizona and suddenly they were stuck as gatekeepers for this program that they had no clue how to counsel patients about. And so they passed this resolution saying that all, um, basically eliminate all barriers to marijuana research. And so that was a big achievement and shows a huge culture change with physicians in Arizona. And you can see how detailed this resolution is. It's not just eliminate barriers. They basically say that the NIDA 
uh, monopoly should be overturned, that we, there should not be a second redundant review by Public Health Service, NIDA, um, when it comes to, and, and they basically say sell marijuana at cost to any FDA approved, DEA approved um, to investigator. So that was a big achievement. And I think th this quote by Dr. Saber really sums it up the best, that you know, if we know that there's a plan out there that has the potential to reduce human suffering, we have a duty to demand that this plant be studied properly. And I think that this is a, a good example of how giving um, money to elected officials works because when we um, started writing checks and making good, you know, solid political contributions, we were um, able to get our entire Arizona congressional delegation to pay attention and we got our Arizona Medical Association to, to write this letter to them and attach this letter which MAPS wrote. Um, so Rick and his team there put together this letter for our congressman explaining um, how, you know, basically outlining the problem with this second redundant review and why the NIDA monopoly is so damaging. And the congressmen are preparing to submit this letter to HHS within the next couple of weeks. So this was a big, um, a big solid victory. And I'll just give you a couple glimpses of some other things that I just I thought you might be curious about. This is, so in Arizona, our medical marijuana program is starting, you know, it's, it's gathering a lot of media attention, and we now have about 40,000 cardholders in Arizona, and they've raised a ton of money. So even though our program hasn't really been implemented yet, like we don't have hardly any dispensaries up and running yet, that'll happen this summer, but we already have a $7 million surplus, and we have no you know, real program in place yet. So this is really exciting, because what happens in Arizona, we have a Voter Protection Act, and it says that that money cannot be swept by the legislature. So that money's just sitting there at the health department waiting to be doled out somewhere. And we've been arguing from day one that that money should go to research, and we haven't been able to make any headway until we started making political contributions, and now suddenly they are um, actually meeting with us. And we had a good meeting with the Attorney General, and um, he's willing to rethink the language of the law. The language of Prop 203 says that um, the money, any surplus money, can only be used for admin of the program to administer Prop 203. And so we're trying to argue that administering the program would include doing research because they are required to required to adjudicate new qualifying diagnoses every six months, and they really don't have a lot of randomized controlled trials looking at um, adding these different diagnoses. So we're hoping that that's going to come about, but I just wanted to throw that out there because I think that a lot of um, medical marijuana states probably have this surplus, and it takes um, demanding that information, or you won't find out, because we nobody advertises that, right? And we had to insist and keep insisting, and you know, public records requests and all that until we finally got them to um, to announce that. So I would encourage anybody who's in a medical marijuana state to try to find out if you have surplus money and demand that be used for science. Um, and this is just. I want to just show you that an example. Our, these are the qualifying diagnoses for us. PTSD is not on there. You can see chronic pain is the big one that um, that we're all um, contending with now because what happens is um, it's a big political problem for us to get buy-in from our elected officials. We, we want to try to get to quantify what that chronic pain really looks like. And so what we're doing is to get around the NIDA monopoly. Until NIDA agrees to sell a study drug, we're going to do just a purely observational study looking at PTSD and chronic pain. And so hopefully by next year I'll be able to give you guys some data on that. We're just launching that right now, and I'm really excited to see um, what we can, um, what, what kind of science we can collect on that. And this is just um, an example of the breakdown. I, I know all the states are probably dealing with this same thing. We're trying to get more MDs and DOs to understand the importance of participating in our program. You can see that it's pretty unbalanced right now. But what what we're doing is we've launched a big um, PR campaign to work with our kind of mainstream docs to get them to understand why this is so important for their patients, and so we're hoping that that's going to help. So I think that's about it. Thank you so much, you guys.